When we talk about money in sociology, dollars are never enough. When we talk about money in sociology, we're usually talking about comparing some kinds of people to other kinds of people. This may refer to income, how much money a person has coming in over a particular amount of time. It may refer to wealth, how much money or value a person has accumulated. It may refer to absolute poverty, the condition in which a person doesn't have enough money or other valuable things uh, to live on. It may refer to relative poverty, the state in which a person has less than most other people have or makes in income less than other people make. We may be interested in talking about inequality, how money is concentrated in the hands of a few people or dispersed uh, across a large group of people. In any of those cases, we're interested in asking two questions. What is the situation like now? And how has it changed over time? And often we'll find that when we're talking about income, wealth, poverty, inequality, good times, hard times, we end up thinking about change over time. For instance, think about a conversation with your grandfather or perhaps your great grandfather. You've probably had this conversation in which your grandfather says to you, oh, you sure you have a minimum wage of seven dollars and 25 cents? But back in 1950, I didn't complain and I just had a minimum wage of 75 cents an hour. That's a whole lot less, isn't it? Or you may have had a conversation with your parents when you're thinking about the prospect of buying a new home. And you find that the median sales price for a new home is roughly $290,000. Your parents may have remarked, wow, you know, we had it really good a generation ago. A generation ago, I remember we just paid a little bit more than $82,000 for our home. It was a new home too. And your parents may say, wow, we had it better. Well, who's right? Who's wrong? Uh, did your parents have it better? Do you think that uh, your grandfather or great-grandfather had it worse? In order to answer this question, we can't simply look at the value of dollars. Because the truth is that a dollar does not buy what a dollar used to buy. 75 cents back in 1950 may have bought quite a bit more in food, in clothing, in shelter, and in medical services than it would buy today. Now, the Bureau of Labor Statistics has a measurement. It's called the Consumer Price Index, and it uses highfalutin language. Uh, it says that the CPI refers to the average price change for the consumption sector of the American economy. But in everyday language, it means how much did things used to cost and how much do things cost now? So what the economists do at the CPI every month is they look at something that's called a market basket, a certain set of goods like food or clothing, services like a visit to the doctor, and they take that set uh, and, and imagine that they put it in a basket and they try to buy it, they find out how much it costs. And then they take a look at how much it costs the next month, how much it costs the next month, and so on and so forth. And the result they get with that market basket is a number, and that is the Consumer Price Index. Now, the Consumer Price Index in January 1950 was 23.5. The Consumer Price Index in January 1985 was 105.5. The Consumer Price Index for January 2015 was 233.7. What do these numbers mean? Just like the value of a dollar, they mean nothing 
by themselves for only one unit of time, but they mean a whole lot if you compare two units of time. Let's put two of these in a fraction. Let's compare January 2015 to January 1950. To do that, we'll put the consumer price index for January 2015 on the top of a fraction in the numerator. We will put 233.70 on the top. For January 1950, we'll put the CPI down in the denominator in the bottom of the fraction, 23.5. Divide the two and you'll get a result, 9.944, about 9.94. Now, what can you do with that number? Well, first of all, you can say your goods and services in general cost 9.94 times as many dollars in 2015 as they did in 1950. What can you do with that? Well, you can take uh, that 75 cent minimum wage, you can multiply 0.75 dollars times 9.94. 9.4, and you'll find out that that's equivalent to a minimum wage of $7 and about 41, 42 cents. In other words, your grandfather or great grandfather in 1950, who was working for minimum wage, got paid the equivalent of a higher minimum wage than people are being paid today. The value of the minimum wage has had a lot of changes over time, always going up in the actual dollar value of how much people get paid. That's called the nominal value. Uh, nominal is a word that means name, and this refers to the idea that a one dollar bill will always be worth in name one dollar. But then there's something that economists and other social scientists call real value, which is how much you can buy in, in those terms. And if we convert all of those dollars, like we did grandfather's dollars, uh, his wage of 75 cents up to $7.41, and, and 41, 42 cents an hour, if we take all that money, all those minimum wages over time, and we convert them to 2015 dollars, we get a much different picture of the value of what people were paid for an hour's work in a minimum wage over time. And that's the line you see here, which is called real wages. Nominal wages, real wages for the minimum wage. Those two lines tell you a completely different story. One about the name of a dollar bill, the other about how much people are being valued for their work. What about the question of parents? Back in 1985, your parents, if they paid the typical amount, the median amount in the sales price for a new home, they paid $82,500. In January 2015, if you bought a house, the median sales price for a new home was $289,400. Now who's getting a better deal? Who's paying less for a new home? We'll ignore for the moment the fact that maybe homes have changed over the last 30 years, but let's consider instead just the difference in cost. How do you compare $289,400 to $82,500 when dollars were worth more a generation ago per dollar than they are now? You use the consumer price index. Uh, let's see what the actual change is in the value of what was bought. Let's go again to our fraction. Let's put in the top of the fraction a uh, consumer price index for January 2015. In the bottom, the consumer price index for January 1985. That's 233.7 divided by 105.5. The result we get when we divide one by the other is 2.215. In other words, Back in 1985, the, the amount that you could pay for with a dollar bill, the amount of stuff you could get was 2.215 times as much stuff. Or to put it another way, in January 2015, you have to pay 2.215 times as much in order to get the same sort of thing. So when we think about that, and then we take the original sales price in 1985 dollars, 82,500 dollars, 
and we multiply that by 2.215. We notice that if housing prices had just kept pace with the rate of inflation, they would have led to the median new home price being just $182,737.50. Now, that's still a lot of money, just like $82,000 was a lot of money back in 1985, but it's nowhere near $289,400. And this is how you can figure out that housing prices have not kept pace with the rate of inflation. They've gone up higher than the rate of inflation. Now, what's the reason for that? What are the social forces behind that? Uh, is it diminishing land? Is it that people are building bigger houses? Well, those are complicated questions. But at least if you think about the value of money in two periods of time and you compare them using the consumer price index, you can ask the question, is this a typical price increase? Or is this something that is galloping beyond uh, the rate of inflation.